So when it comes to learning guitar, there are plenty of different methods. You could get lessons, you could buy books, you could watch YouTube videos. But one of the things that worked incredibly well for me, especially when I was first starting out, was transcribing and learning riffs from my favorite players, my favorite bands by ear. So in today's video, I'm gonna show you 10 classic riffs that I believe will make you a better guitar player. Before we jump into the video, a quick plug for my new video course, Fretboard Fundamentals. If you're trying to learn guitar and get a better understanding of the fretboard and how to actually play this thing. I made a video course dedicated to that very subject. You can find out more about it in the description box down below. We developed this course for everyone from a complete beginner who's just starting out all the way to a player who's been playing for years but might have a few holes in your knowledge of theory for guitar and the fretboard. So if you wanna learn more about it, you can find a link in the description to fretboard fundamentals. With that out of the way, let's jump in and take a look at the first riff on our list. Starting with 10 Years Gone, because I think this is one of Zeppelin's best songs in general, and I think it's one of Page's best riffs that he ever wrote. It's certainly one of my favorites, and I think it points to Jimmy Page's brilliance and genius as a guitar player and as a songwriter. There's one specific part of this riff that I wanted to focus on here because there's some interesting techniques and some ideas that can be gleaned from learning this riff. Uh, the second half of the riff, where he goes... That's actually a pretty difficult section, especially for someone who's relatively new to guitar. It can be kind of a, a hand twister. And this is something that I think everyone plays a little differently. When he goes to these descending thirds here, you can approach it like this with your third and fourth finger playing that major third. And then go down to your third finger and your first finger for that minor third and then down to your second finger and your first finger. But what I started doing that helped me out was... It can be a little bit difficult to get under your fingers at first, but this idea of moving around and playing a combination of some melody lines inside of chords is something that you're gonna encounter a lot as a guitar player. Hendrix also does this all the time. But this particular one, the 10 Years Gone riff, I think is a great, a great way to break into that. So speaking of finger twisters, this next riff is uh, a bit of a stretch. Message in a Bottle is another iconic riff, and this one's great for a finger exercise and a warm-up and hand exercise. In fact, that's how I play it most often is as a way to warm up because it is a pretty big stretch. So essentially what Andy Summers is doing here is taking this pretty simple chord. This is a C sharp add nine where we have to root the fifth and the ninth. So we have C sharp, we have G sharp, and we have D sharp, but he's playing them spread out across three whole steps right here on the fretboard. So you have, and then we go down to A, add nine, same voicing, just in this position, or you could play it here. Then B add nine, then F sharp add nine. And this is a really good way to stretch your hands and kind of build that dexterity in your left hand. It's a pretty simple and straight ahead riff, but I think there's a lot to be gained from learning Message in a Bottle, so I'd recommend picking it up. Next up on the list is one of my all-time favorite funk riffs. I 
think Sissy Strut is an absolute must know riff for any guitar player that's even mildly interested in funk guitar. And if you're not hip to the meters at all, I mean, I think you should be. But this is a pretty straight ahead riff that's somewhat difficult to play right. In order to get it to sound right, there's more going on than just playing the notes in time. The first thing to focus on is time. This is very, very laid back, very deep in the pocket. In order to play it like the meters do, you need to be comfortable with laying back and playing a little bit behind the beat. The way that the notes are picked, the way they're played is very staccato and very deliberate, especially on that B section. It's this. A riff like this is all about feel and timing and how you are playing the note. It's about your right hand and your left hand working together to not just play in time, but know when to stop the note, how long to let the note ring out for. These are all really, really important details that make a riff like Sissy Strut sound right. So next on the list, we've got our first riff that's in odd meter. <laughs> Let's be honest, if you clicked on the video that had 10 classic riffs in the title, you could probably guess that money was gonna be on the list somewhere. But we're talking about this for a few different reasons. And first of all is the time signature. If you've never noticed, this is not in 4-4 four, four, or 6-8 or 3-4, it's actually in 7-4. That's seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, so on and so forth. And it can be a little tricky to keep in time and get the riff right in an odd meter like that if you're new to it. So it's worth learning for that reason alone and also because it's one of the best Pink Floyd songs ever. But there's also another element to this, which is how the riff is played and the way that they're arpeggiating or breaking down the chords. Essentially, what Gilmore is doing here is mimicking or doubling the bass line that Roger Waters is playing. And as such, it's played like a bass line. There's this sort of bounce and swing to it that sometimes guitar riffs don't always have inherent in their feel. Especially on the turnaround, if you listen to how Gilmore approaches this, it's... <laughs> Essentially, he's just keeping that same kind of bounce and swing that the bass has got going on. And I think that's a really important thing to focus on when learning and playing this riff. And now continuing the theme of money, here's our next riff from a little band from Texas. <laughs> just got paid is all in the right hand. It's in the picking hand. This is a great riff to learn if you're trying to work on your alternate picking and string skipping. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to play it. If you play it in open E like uh, Billy Gibbons originally did, the approach is a little bit different, but I'm just playing it in standard. And when you play it in standard, it kind of gives you this interesting little string skipping pattern in the right hand. <laughs> If you watch my right hand moving back and forth, it's... And then there's also this interesting little flourish that happens in the left hand where you have to go from E to pull off to G, back to E here on the seventh fret. Now you can do it in the open position here. Um, 
which in some ways is easier in the left hand, but it also expands that right hand string skipping thing. The strings are further apart. So this is a really great one to learn to help get your picking hand together and to get your alternate picking accuracy together. Plus it's a classic ZZ Top riff that's a ton of fun to play. Too, and I'm a huge, huge fan of The Edge. And I picked this riff uh, for this list for a few different reasons. The first is the idea of using effects to become part of the sound, part of the instrument, if you will. Uh, the Edge is famous for using what's called dotted eighth delay. And if you're not familiar with dotted eighth delay, this is what he's playing without a delay pedal engaged. <laughs> Very, very simple part, not a lot going on, but listen to what happens when I turn the delay on. You get this rhythmic pinging that's happening in time with the guitar part to where it sounds like multiple guitars playing the same part. Now, Edge wasn't the first player to utilize this technique, but I think he was certainly the one that made it the most popular. Uh, and it's ubiquitous in styles of playing like the worship field, for example. In fact, you would not have worship guitar without the Edge. But there's something else going on here that I think is important to focus on, and that's how the Edge uses very, very simple parts to move between chord progressions, uh, sort of like voice leading. The idea of voice leading is simply playing chord progressions and moving between chords while changing as few notes as possible. And if you look at this part here for still haven't found what I'm looking for, uh, we're playing a B flat major, right? And then we're going to an E flat major, right? One to four. But Edge is voicing the B flat like this. It's basically just a B flat power chord with a major seventh on top. And then when the band goes to the four chord, he's not changing his voicing or his part at all other than picking the bass note. And over that E flat, it becomes this nice, beautiful Lydian sound, this raised four here, gives it this really beautiful, airy, anthemic kind of sound. When you combine that with the dotted eighth delay, you have a beautiful riff that stands on its own and is unique to the edge. I recommend learning something like this, A, to get your chops up on the idea of using effects to inform what you play and how you play it, and B, try out voice leading with just some really simple chord voicings moving through progressions like this. Money for Nothing is by far the most difficult riff on this list. This is legitimately really, really tough to play properly. And in fact, I don't even know that I played it exactly like Mark Knopfler does on record. Now that all my excuses for not playing it properly are out of the way, this is a really great riff to try and learn because it drops the pick out of the right hand and forces you to focus on some fingerstyle technique. Now I made a video on fingerstyle playing for acoustic earlier this year, which you can check out here. And some of those techniques that I talked about in that video are applicable here in this riff, like the walking bass line on the thumb. This riff is all about the timing and the feel and the intricacies of, of the right hand picking, finger picking technique and the left hand talking together, playing very, very percussively in the Mark Knopfler style. If you can manage to get this riff down, it's really, really fun to play, and it is a really good workout for your right hand and getting that finger style technique down. But uh, it, this one was tough for me, I'll admit it. I, I spent a lot of time trying to learn it, and this was not my first time trying to get this riff down. Uh, and I even have trouble playing it the right way now after learning it for this video. So it's something I'm gonna be working on for a while, but there's a lot to be gleaned from this particular riff, which is why it's on the list. Yeah. 
Now, as guitar riffs go, it's hard to get more solid and straight ahead than Killing in the Name of. It's a great riff. It's instantly recognizable. And there's one part of this that I want to focus on, and that is how funky this riff actually is. You might not think about it in the context of Rage Against the Machine, but this riff is actually somewhat funky. And there's one element that's happening in Tom Morello's right hand that is really making this riff happen. <laughs> It's that chucka thing that's happening, that really rhythmic percussive thing that he's doing in between the notes in the riff that's giving it that kind of funky feel. And like Sissy Strut, this riff is all about pocket playing. It's all about laying back uh, and being just behind the beat a little bit. <laughs> It really is all about that right hand and staying in the pocket and keeping that sort of funk guitar chucka chucka thing going in between the notes. That's what makes this riff great. And that's why this is a good one to practice and to learn to kind of help get your right hand in shape and playing in the pocket. <laughs> about Barracuda is it's a great sort of upbeat galloping shuffle kind of riff. The main part of the riff is. And again, this one focuses a lot on the right hand. This is a pocket part, a lot like Sissy Strut. And it's also a, a good technique to kind of get your right hand, your picking hand together for this kind of galloping, driving riff thing while palm muting. The... And then from there you go. Throw those harmonics in, which is another classic technique. You're going to use it all the time. But the main focus of this riff is getting that right hand galloping, driving riff thing together and doing it in time and in the pocket, which can be a little bit more difficult than it initially seems. This is a great technique for beginners to work on. It's a great riff to work on. It's instantly recognizable. As soon as you go, people immediately know what you're playing, and that's a lot of fun. Jimi Hendrix riff, but the one we're looking at today is actually Gary Clark Jr.'s version of it, which if you've never heard Gary's cover of this song, it's fantastic, and I'd highly recommend checking it out. But the thing that I like about the way Gary approaches it, other than the massive fuzz tone that it gets, is this idea of playing a melody up the neck instead of just in one box. A perfect example of this is how the riff starts, where it goes up to the major third over the E. That interval right there, the open E string with the high G sharp on the 11th fret of the fifth string really creates this awesome rub, this harmonic sort of thing that's happening back and forth. And when you have a fuzz pedal on like I do, it creates this huge sounding interval. <laughs> the 
fifth string and utilizing the neck. And what's cool about that is when you play notes in different registers of the neck, they sound different, right? If I play a note up here versus down here, it's gonna have a different tone and a different timbre and a different feel. So utilizing a riff like this to kind of help give you a layout of the fretboard moving up and down the neck is really cool. And again, using this major third over E is a nice little secret hack that I love to do. classic riffs I think everyone should know. Let me know what you thought about this list in the comments section down below. What would you put on this list or what was the riff that really helped you break through something new on guitar? Don't forget you can check out Fretboard Fundamentals, my new video course in the description box down below, as well as my other courses like the Tone course and the Nashville Number System course. If you're interested in any of the gear that I used in today's video, you can find some affiliate links down there as well. Don't forget to subscribe here on YouTube and check me out on Instagram and TikTok at Rhett Scholl. Thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate it. And remember, there is no plan B.